I remember years ago, R.C. Sproul was sharing about a husband who had deep resentment towards his wife, and so he brought them into counseling. And he said to the husband, can you love your wife as a husband is called to love his wife? As the scripture says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Can you love your wife in this way? And he said, I'm sorry, but I cannot do that. And so Sproul said, well, can you at least love your wife as your neighbor? The Bible says we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. He said, I don't even think I can love my wife as my neighbor. And so Sproul said to him, then you must love your wife as your enemy, for the Lord Jesus commands us, love our enemies. And I think the point of that story is, that there is never an excuse for us not to love another person. There is no loophole we can take to avoid loving another. We are to love even the most contemptible and worthless of individuals. We are to love those who have injured us and committed injustices against us. We are to forgive those who have sinned against us. And we are to forgive them <clears throat> even though it may be difficult. It is completely adverse to our human nature to love those who despise us. And yet God calls us to do so. In Luke chapter 10, a lawyer approaches Jesus and they've just reminded themselves of the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then the lawyer says to Jesus, because he wanted to justify himself, he said, and who is my neighbor? Now a Jew in Jesus' day would have defined neighbor as one of his own people, a fellow Jew, one who is of his own kin, one who belongs to his own race and own religion. And so Jesus took that definition and he threw it into the trash heap and he broadened the definition of neighbor. And Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, saying that there was this man who was beaten by robbers and left for dead. But this Samaritan came and showed him mercy and showed love to this man. And what's extraordinary about this is that Jews hated the Samaritans and their hatred and disgust for Samaritans went back centuries. As Jesus is telling this parable, this lawyer would have experienced great discomfort and distress. And so Jesus was giving this man a new definition for the name labor or the name neighbor, saying that we are to be a neighbor for anyone who is in need, whether they be your friend or whether they be your foe. Jesus doesn't give us an excuse for not loving another person. And so Jesus says in verses 43 and 44, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, before we go any further in this sermon, I want to give you two qualifications because I think this passage does not apply to two scenarios. And the first scenario is this. This passage does not apply to civil government. Romans chapter 13 tells us that the government is to bear the power of the sword as a servant of God in order to deter and punish evil whether this involves evil within its own borders or evil of other nations that are acting aggressively in trying to conquer other lesser innocent nations, government can use either the threat of the sword or the power of the sword to either deter evil or to conquer evil in this world. And so if an enemy nation threatens our sovereignty or the sovereignty of other lesser nations, then I hope 
that as a nation we would enter into that conflict and that we would be willing to subdue that enemy nation as long as these conflicts and wars are deemed just in God's eyes. We as a nation should not be passive in watching evil nations show aggression to conquer other nations or even our own. But secondly, this passage does not apply to God's judgment. There are those who have been our enemies for a long time and who have treated us unjustly. And despite our attempts to love them, they continue in their rebellion and they show no evidence of softening or repentance. And so the day will come when these enemies of ours They will die and one day appear before the judgment seat of God. And they will face the wrath and punishment of God in hell for eternity. And then God will have made all our wrongs right as those who have been, as we have been mistreated. And they will receive the due penalties for their wrongdoing. And so there comes a point in which our love for our enemy turns into rejoicing for God's justice. I think of Revelation chapter 6, and we have a picture of heaven, and we have a gathering of the martyrs who have been martyred while here on earth for their faith. And they want God to show forth justice. And so the martyrs cry out to God in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? You see, they're asking for justice. And so in in eternity, this passage does not apply. This sermon today is about loving our enemies And so we will consider two points. First, why are we to love our enemies? And then second, how are we to love our enemies? And when I say how, I mean how in terms of how can we be made capable of loving our enemies? So first, why are we to love our enemies? I think in this passage, there are three compelling reasons why we are to love our enemies. And the first reason is this. We are to love our enemies because it shows proof that we belong to God. Notice verse 45. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Loving our enemies does not earn for us favor and acceptance from God, but rather loving our enemies is evidence or proof or confirmation that we are truly God's adopted sons and daughters. If you refuse to love those whom you deem your enemies, then you are most likely not a believer. That's what this passage is saying. And we need to realize that our enemies are closer to us than we would like to admit. Our enemies might be within our own family. They might be within the church. They might be within our own marriages. They might be within the workplace. And are we loving our enemies? 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. The gospel is about loving those who are difficult to love, and I would say, even impossible to love. And if this is not in your spiritual DNA, then you must question whether you even belong to God as his son or daughter. A second reason we are to love our enemies is that we are to love 
not expecting anything in return. This is the way of Christian love. We love without expecting anything in return. Verses 46 and 47. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You see, worldly love always expects a return on its investment. You scratch my back, and I'll scratch your back. Worldly love is reciprocal. Worldly love is payment for services rendered. Worldly love does not give of itself unless there is some benefit, some reward, some advantage. Worldly love is always asking, what's in it for me? Worldly love is really no love at all. What is so great about loving those who love you in return? When we love our enemies... Jesus does not promise that they will change and become our friends and treat us with respect. Jesus calls us to love those who hate us and plan evil against us. In the Old Testament, this is called by the Hebrew word hesed. It is often referred to as covenant love. In the New Testament, it is the Greek word agape. And this kind of love is not based upon another's response to us. In other words, with said love, you love another individual independently of how they treat you. It has been referred to as a one-way love. It is Jesus kneeling down and washing his disciples' feet, realizing that one pair of those feet belong to Judas the betrayer, who's about to hand him over to the authorities so he can be crucified. It is Jesus dying on the cross and saying of those who are crucifying him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. To love our enemies goes against everything in our nature. And yet this is the kind of love that is to characterize believers. We are to love those who hate us, who put us down, who ridicule us, who make fun of us, who gossip about us, who say unkind things to our face, who ignore us, who neglect us, who turn away from us. And this is not an easy thing to do. And as I said before, I dare say it is impossible. Many years ago at a Stanford hospital, a little girl named Liza was suffering from a rare and serious disease. Her only chance of recovery appeared to be a blood transfusion from her five-year-old brother who had miraculously survived this same disease and had developed antibodies that this little girl needed in order to combat the illness. And so the doctor was explaining this to the little five-year-old boy. Are you willing to give your blood to your sister? And the little boy just paused. And he took a big, deep breath. And he said, if it will help my sister live, then I'll, I'll do it. And so the day came for the transfusion, and he is lying next to his sister in a gurney, and the blood's flowing from him into his sister. And as he's looking at his sister, her color is getting better. But as he's doing that, his face becomes pale. And he speaks to the doctor. And with a nervous tone, he asks the doctor, Will I start to die right away? He thought he was going to give all of his blood to his sister. He thought he was giving up his life for her. And I wonder, are we capable of loving in that kind of way? So willingly and with great cost and sacrifice, 
to love another who we deem our enemy. Thirdly, Christians are called to a higher standard. Notice verse 48. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Again, to love our enemies is an impossible undertaking, yet God commands us to do so. And it seems cruel that God commands us to do that which we are incapable of. And yet we have witnessed this all through the Sermon on the Mount, haven't we? God says, when you are angry in your heart, you've committed the transgression of murder. When you've lust after, lusted after another woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And now Christ is saying we're to love our enemies. But we must understand the purpose of the law. One of the purposes of the law is to be a mirror to us and reflects back to us the holiness of God. And when we look into that mirror that is the law, we see our wretchedness. We see our sinfulness. And what happens when we see all of our sin? Well, we flee to the one who can help us. The only one. Jesus Christ. Because in him we have forgiveness. In him we receive mercy. In him we have hope. And in him we have life. But notice further in verse 48, it says there, you therefore must be perfect. Now this phrase appears in the Greek future indicative, so it literally reads, you shall be perfect. In other words, we are a work in progress and God is not through with us yet. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So we're working towards that goal in which we will one day be glorified. We will one day be perfected. But nevertheless, God never relaxes his commands. He does not water down his law. He does not provide loopholes for our escape. He does not allow us to ignore his standard of holiness and righteousness. It is an impossible standard. But we serve a God for whom nothing is impossible. So then, how are we to love our enemies? How are we made capable to love our enemies. And there are two offerings of grace. And the first is this. We must realize that God loved us while we were his enemies. God did not rescue good people or decent sinners. God did not give his life for his friends or his buddies or his loved ones. God did not become a savior for those who were lovely or worthy. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 7, what it says of the unbeliever. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 22. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Do you see what these verses say? They say that Christ died for those who despised him, who were hostile to him, who rejected him, who wanted nothing to do with him. We are like sheep that are continually straying from our shepherd, we resist God, we oppose God, we defy God, we spurn God, 
And God dies for and redeems a people who want nothing to do with him. I've heard people ask, how can God send anyone to hell to endure eternal punishment? And my question is, why does God save any of us? Why does God save me? Why does God pursue a people who want nothing to do with him? I can't wrap my head around that. When we come to understand that God saves and dies for a people who are his enemies, then I think we are given a much different mindset in terms of our approach to our enemies. Because if Christ did not die for his enemies, none of us would be saved. But I think there's a second offering of grace found in this passage. And the second offering of grace is that God imparts to us his heart. This is hinted at in this passage. Twice in this passage, God is referred to as Father in verse 45 and 48. And the implication is that as God's people, we are to take on our Father's likeness and we are to take on our Father's heart. In Father's uh, Day in June, uh, my son John came up to me and he said, Dad, you're my second most favorite father. And I'm thinking, okay, who's first? I want to get my hands on him and show him a thing or two. And of course, he's speaking about his heavenly father. I think I need one of those t-shirts to say second greatest father in the world or something. But that's what we want for our kids, right? We want their relationship with their Heavenly Father to take precedence. And so God has given into our hearts as believers the Holy Spirit, who is really the spirit of sonship. Notice Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so we are enabled to think and act like sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father because we have the Holy Spirit to help us and to guide us and to remind us to whom we belong. The Holy Spirit enables us to act with the heart of our Heavenly Father so that we indeed can love our enemies. Do you see that divine assistance that we have? Corey Ten Boom was put in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II for hiding Jews in her home. And not only was she put in the concentration camp, but her whole family with her. And much of her family, if not all of her family, were exterminated and killed in the concentration camp. But she was able to survive the Nazis tormented and persecuted them mercilessly. And so the war had ended and the camps had been liberated and Corey was speaking in various churches, sharing about God's love and faithfulness, even in the midst of the horror. And she was at a church service in Munich and she saw a former Nazi SS guard who she recognized who stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrook. And all of those terrifying memories came back to her. The ridicule, the beatings, the cruelty flooding back into her heart. And this former SS guard recognized Corey and came up to her at, at, at the end of the service when the church was emptying and said, how grateful I am for your message, Fräulein. He said to think that as you say, he has washed my sins away. Now this former SS guard was a Christian. And so he thrust out his hand to take 
Corey's hand. But all the angry, vengeful thoughts flooded into her soul and she could not lift up her hand to take his. She could not even manage a smile. And so Corey prayed to herself, Lord Jesus, forgive me and help me to forgive him. She tried to smile. She struggled to raise her hand, but she could not do it. She felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity towards this individual. And so again, she breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And this is what Corey Ten Boom wrote in her book, The Hiding Place. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. Well, into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his when he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. See what the gospel tells us? That we love because God first loved us. When you have trouble loving someone, whether friend or foe, ask God for the love that you need because it is in his nature and his will to answer that prayer. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, you call us to an impossible task, which is to love our enemies. Yet if you had not loved us while we were your enemies, then we would be lost forever. Lord, give us hearts filled with your love to love our enemies, even if it be a family member, a co-worker, a friend, or even a spouse. Lord, help us to take on your heart and your likeness that we may love as you love. In Jesus we pray, amen.